Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Foursquare Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply it to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging onto our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. came to visit, we always took him to church, and that time was Communion Sunday. And so, I didn't know, like some of you, well, what do we do with the children? When, when can they take Communion? Well, there's two schools of thought on, on that. One is that as they're growing up, you, you let them partake of Communion, and then when they're old enough to accept the Lord and understand it, then it becomes meaningful to them, but they understand it because they've grown up with it, and taking Communion. That's one way. The other way is to instruct them in the things of the Lord, and then when they get old enough to accept the Lord and probably get baptized, then they're old enough to take communion. Those are the two schools of thought. So halfway in the middle, since he wasn't always with us, I, I, as we were getting ready to take communion, I asked him, do you know what communion means? Five-year-old, six-year-old said, yes, the little bread, that's the body of Christ. He died for our sins and was broken for our salvation. I thought, wow. Sounds like a theology book. He, and I said, uh, and, it's, and the cup. He says, the, cu- the cup is the, the blood of Christ that, that, that saves us. And I thought, he's got it. He's got it. So we started taking communion. And as we took the, the bread, that was fine. We prayed over it. We were, we were praying in, in groups of, of families or groups of friends. We were taking communion that way. And so it was just Carmen, myself, and, and our son, and... Uh, and, uh, and Moses, Aaron is probably up in the sound booth, and and so then we come to the cup, and as he picks up the cup, he says, "Cheers." <laughs> I said, "Well, not quite it, you know." <laughs> but but you know we 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 have communion once a month, and uh, this year I am celebrating uh, 50 years of being a preacher. Yeah. May 18, 1963, we graduated from Bible school. I had been preaching before then, but officially, you know, as a recognized preacher, uh, 50 years this year. And so you grow up listening every week. By the time you're five, six years old, you can, you can do communion yourself. You could actually do it. And uh, we've heard uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 many, many times. For I, and I memorized it. For I received the Lord, which uh, I also passed on to you, that on the night the Lord was, was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Right? We've heard that. Well, I memorized it. Actually, I memorized it like, porque yo recibido el Señor también lo que vos otros Kind of like that, right? And, but there, there's more to it. Uh, you're going to get a workout with your Bible uh, today. Did we get the handouts that had like a prayer and a, and a little outline. That's just a miniature outline of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, it has a, a few scriptures there. The one in Corinthians, the part that the, in chapter 11 that I already um, mentioned, but then it goes on to this part. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, listen to that, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep, that is, died. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. In other words, when it's communion, it's not just a ritual that we just take the wafer, drink the cup, and that's it. 
There's a lot more to it. Actually, communion was instituted during the Seder, during the Passover. And that's what it is. We've taken a little, itty bitty little part, about 10 minutes worth, out of a three hour or four hour dinner. And today I want to call today's sermon, The Unfinished Dinner. The Unfinished Dinner. And now there are cer certain things that, that we have to uh, get in our mind. I want you to use your, um, your uh, imagination and visualize what some of these things are. Uh, in, what is it, 22 years of teaching college, I think the most important thing that a college student can have is, that I've learned, is to be able to visualize what is being taught or what you are learning. If you can visualize it, you got it. Otherwise, it's just a concept in space. And you can either memorize the formulas or, or the verses or whatever it is that you're studying. But if you visualize it, if you can see it in your mind, it's yours. I want you to do that today. First of all, I want you to erase, delete that picture that we have that uh, of all of them sitting around the table, everybody facing the camera. Right? Uh, it couldn't have happened that way. It, <laughs> How, have you ever been to, to a party where everybody sits on the same side? Of, let's go to the restaurant. Let's go to Red Robin today and everybody sit on one side of the booth, right? Huh? They, they, they all, <laughs> you almost expect them to say, cheese. <laughs> now, the other thing is that it could not have been just the 12. Because children are involved in a Seder. They have a part in it. The other thing is that men don't Especially back then, today they did. Aaron is a great cook. But uh, men didn't prepare the meals. The women did, right? And when, wherever Jesus went, it wasn't just the 12. There was at least the 70. Or at least the 12 and all the other groupies, right? I mean, when he came into town, there were even some rich people. Because Susanna and the, what, the two others that are mentioned that came down along with the women that came with, with Jesus wherever he traveled, they were the financiers. Susanna, it turns out, was one of the, was married to the treasurer of Rome. People of money. It took money to, 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 to do the ministry, as we know. Right? So there's all these people. The other thing is that it was a large room. Remember it said, prepare a large room. So there had to be all kinds of people. The other thing is, so, so you had more than just the 12. You also had women. You had children. You had all kinds of food, not just, just a, a, a little wafer and, and little cups for everybody. It, this is like a, a, a meal. There's some, something interesting. I'll, we'll talk about the, uh, about the meal. Jesus told his disciples, and in one of the Gospels it mentions the two. I, it, it, their names escape me right now. I can't remember which ones they were. But then it says that when he came, he came with the 12. When they got to the, uh, the, uh, the large room, he came with the 12. They came with him. So they weren't the ones preparing. There were already other people preparing. And uh, when, when you go to a, a, a Seder, you, you find out some of the things that, that, that happened at the Seder, right? Uh, in every Jewish festival, they always begin, as a matter of fact, every, uh, every Shabbat, every Saturday, every uh, Sabbath, uh, begins with the lighting of candles. And the day starts like on Friday night. Right? Like uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, that'll be Monday. Okay. So they do that, and how they figure out when 18 minutes before 6 is, I don't know. That's when they start lighting the candles. But, but that, that was the thing. Uh, a married woman would common, does still commonly light uh, two candles and adds one additional candle for each one of her children. A single uh, woman lights one candle in deference to her mother. Exactly what that means, I don't know, but that's, that's, what, it, uh, that's what happens. Another difference is that the original Passover back in the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 11, it says that they were to eat this meal uh, with, their, uh, with their coat tucked into their belt, 
your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat in haste. In other words, they were supposed to be standing up, ready to go with their shoes on, with, you know, their purse on their shoulder, iPads, cameras, everything ready to go. Here we see them reclining. Reclining. Because the first Passover, they ate it while they were slaves. And we eat the Passover or celebrate communion as free people. We can recline. Because we are at our daddy's house. This is family. We're not slaves. We're not slaves. We're not tied to, to that mud hole. Secondly, instead of one little cup, there were four cups. There are four cups that are, that are drunk at a um, Passover. I want you to notice, if you have your Bibles, I would like you to open to Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. And if you are the kind that marks in your Bible, this would be a good place to mark. And it's in your little handout. In Exodus chapter 6, it says, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. Underline this. I will bring you out. I will bring you out. That's the first promise. And so the first cup represents, I will bring you out. That's the cup of deliverance. Or the cup of uh, separation to separate uh, you from, from Egypt. The, the, uh, the New Testament counterpart to that is 2 Corinthians 6, 6, 6, 17, which most of us know. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch not unclean thing and I will receive you. Come out and be separate. So the first promise is, I will bring you out. How many of you have been brought out? You know where they were coming from? From the whip, from the chains, from the mud holes, from gathering straws, from eating whatever. But Jesus, Jesus in the new covenant established the fact that he has brought us out. And the whole purpose of communion is to remember, remember. When we partake of communion, we are to remember where he, he brought us from. Even, you know, even if you were raised in church like, uh, like some of us and have, and have never sinned, you know, done bad stuff, um, I, I read, I, you know, I read this one scripture that just kills me every time I read it, where Paul says that he is the chiefest of sinners, right? And every time I read it, I want to shout, that's not true. Because I feel I am the chiefest of sinners. But God, when we take communion, we remember that he has brought us out from that place. From Egypt. Back to Exodus. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you. Second cup. The cup of freedom. I will free you. From being slaves to them. I will free you from being slaves. Therefore. If anyone is in Christ. He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. That's a good place for an amen and a hallelujah. Oh my, I'm getting excited here. You have the cup of separation. The cup of freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then the third cup says, I will... I lost my place. And I will redeem you. I will redeem you. You are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. And you have been redeemed. Redeemed from what? Redeemed from the curse of the law. 
The old Passover signa is tied into the law and trying to keep the, the, the... Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The greatest curse that the law brings, if anyone should break the law, they should be put to death. He has redeemed us from the curse of the law, and we have passed from death unto life. So when we celebrate communion, we celebrate redemption from the curse of the law. You still, and we, we still are in our human body, but our nature have been, has been changed. You do not have to react the way you reacted back then. You have been redeemed if there was a family curse, if all the way back as far as you can remember, like some families that we have known, there has been divorce, there has been alcoholism, there has been anger, there has been bitterness, there has been whatever. You have been redeemed from that. Amen. And it has stopped with Jesus Christ. You have been redeemed from that curse. You don't have to operate that way. <laughs> you have been redeemed from that mud hole. You know, what, what boredom. Imagine being born. And from the time you're old enough to walk, you're taught to play in the mud. It's fun as a kid. But by the time you're 40, 50 years old, and every day you're out there in the mud hole. And that's all you know. And you drag your weary body home. And you crash. I don't know if they had beds. I don't know. What would slaves have? Eat whatever? How, how much could they have? Next morning you get up and you go back to the mud hole. That is not up for whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And from your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, man. When we celebrate communion, it's time to get excited. It's time to be reflective. It's time to recognize. And it's time to shout. Oh, my. If I knew how to play this thing, I would. I, I'm, 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 hold me back. Hold me back. So you have the, 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 the four cups, right? The fourth cup, uh, in Exodus it says, I will take you. I will take you. Let me find that scripture in, in 1 Thessalonians. This is the counter, this is the New Testament counterpart to I will take you. In 1 Thessalonians, Jesus, uh, uh, Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus with those who fell asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven and with a loud command and with a voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise. He will take you. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. And if I go, I, will, I, I, I go to prepare a place that where I am, you will be also. And if I go, I will come again to take you. That's our promise. That's what we live for. Amen. We're not in that mud hole with no hope. I'm telling you, it's time. It's time to get up, suit up, look up, because our redemption is nigh. If we don't, if we don't live for that, then what are we living for? You know, it, it, I, I try to find out which way is east. And every, as long as I can remember, uh, every, every morning, wherever I am, Whatever house I happen to be in, I, I wake up and I try to face these. It's just the, it's not in the Bible. I, I look up. And because and he's coming from the east, it says he'll split the eastern sky. And I look east. One of these days, one of these days, I've been hearing that since I was a, a little boy. And, uh, well, I'm still a little boy at heart. You know. 
but but it, it's been many years but you know what that means it's closer <laughs> it just means it's closer and if we were studying prophecy like we did one, one time when I, when I preached here uh, I mean you can see that, that uh, oh my goodness I, I, I'm getting ready to sing uh, I can see the I can see the father standing at the door Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Let's go back to the first cup. The first cup uh, is consumed after, uh, there's many prayers. Like I said, this, if you've been to a Seder, you know it takes hours, right? Uh, the first cu cup is consumed after the Kaddush, the prayer of sanctification. And uh, it's, it's on your handout, because I, I want us to, to pray that. Uh, in, in a little minute, but uh, and and it's in English because um, uh, I can't say it in, in, in Hebrew. You know, I, I attended a Messianic Jewish synagogue for a couple of years, and, and uh, it's a fantastic experience. I mean, I, I, I felt like I was back in the time of right after Jesus and and, uh, and listening to the the first church and the apostles and all of them. He learned so much. And uh, I wanted to learn Hebrew, and it's open. Anybody can go to, to Hebrew school. But it's all ages. If it's beginner's Hebrew, they're all there. It turns out they were all children. It's the first time I've felt tall in a long time. <laughs> but it's hard. It's hard, you know? Uh, learning this prayer, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu. And that's, 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 that's where I stopped. I, I couldn't learn anymore. And I come back the next week, and I try... Finally, one of the kids, the second week, one of the little kids, bless his little heart from a horrible parents probably, and, and he says, he says, he doesn't know anything. He's just holding us back. <laughs> so the teacher drop kicked me out the door. And, 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 and well, he didn't really. He, he just said, perhaps you would benefit from some personal tutoring. <laughs> And I thought, perhaps the earth will open up and can I just crawl in there? <laughs> so I dropped out. I hate to tell you, but when I tried out for the dance team, they go fast, you know. And there's some little darling again, he can't keep up. I, I was looking for a chair after, after the first time around the, the synagogue. I, oh, Lord, have mercy. <sighs> Let him breathe on me. I was singing, let him breathe on me. I, I couldn't catch my breath. But they pray this prayer. And uh, you have it. I want us to pray. You want to try it? Look at it. And just pray with me. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who createst the fruit of the vine. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, who has chosen us for thy service from among the nations, exalting us by making us holy through thy commandments. In love hast thou given us, O Lord our God, holidays for joy and festivals for gladness. Thou didst give us this feast of unleavened bread, the season of our freedom, in commemoration of our liberation from Egypt. Thou hast chosen us for thy service from among the nations and hast sanctified us by giving us, with love and gladness, thy holy festivals as a heritage. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life, who has preserved us and has enabled us to reach this season. Isn't that beautiful? You can keep that one. Pray it over your meals and maybe in the morning. It's a beautiful prayer. At the beginning of the festival, sometimes in the Seders they do it, sometimes they don't. Um, there was the uh, the uh, rikats, the, the um, purification ritual, and that's where a, a pitcher of water and a basin were brought out and a towel, and people would uh, you know would pour water um, ceremoniously over their hands and then dry them, and they were ceremonially cleaned. At that point in the service, Jesus breaks all kinds of traditions. As we have seen on television, uh, that the worst thing, the biggest insult, the ugliest, dir the dirtiest uh, thing you can do to anybody is give them your foot. See that? 
Remember when Saddam's statue was toppled? They took their shoes off and they beat it with their shoes, symbolizing just curse. I mean, it's nothing we can imagine how bad that is. That is the mindset in which this happened. Instead of the ceremonial washing of the hands, Jesus takes a towel, wraps it around himself, and he kneels down and starts washing their feet. Their feet. I don't know if you've ever been in a foot washing ceremony. We should try it sometime. Oh my. I can't think of a more holy, more spiritual moment. It is absolutely humbling if you're the person that's getting your feet washed. Doing the washing is not so hard. Sitting there in a chair and letting somebody wash your feet, oh my Lord. You begin to feel the love and the presence of God in, in a way that your body can't control it. It's the Shekinah glory of God. And that's what they must have felt. But their mindset was, this is foul. This is dirty. This is, how can you do that at, 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 the, at the Passover? You know why? Because the ceremonial washing of the hands was part of the law. It was symbolic of trying to keep all of the commandments which they couldn't. The washing of the feet symbolizes the total cleansing of the worst of sinners. The blackest of sins. Total cleansing. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is, a, and we're jumping around, because otherwise we'd have to do the whole Seder, right? And I, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. But we're jumping around just to get the highlights so that when we take communion, we understand its, its meaning. Um, there's some, um, some food that is prepared. There's some greens, uh, celery, watercress, or parsley, but they're dipped in salt water. So you can imagine. Have you ever had celery dipped in salt water? Yum, yum. <laughs> Take a little sandwich bag, we let it all cut up, dipped in salt water. I don't think so. The greens are a giving of thanks for the fruit of the earth. And the little prayer goes something like this, because it varies from Seder to Seder. In tasting of the salt water, we are asked to remember the tears which our ancestors shed while suffering the tortures of slavery. May our gratitude for the blessings which we enjoy help to soften the pain of sorrow and convert tears to joy and appreciation. Wow. Wow. You ever, you ever cry? You ever shed a tear? He will take our tears. You know, in that place, there will be no more pain, no more death. No more suffering and what? No more tears. No more tears. No more tears. Oh, Jesus. There's also some bitter herbs like horseradish or radish or endive. I'm not exactly sure what endive is. It doesn't sound good. <laughs> and that is to remind us of, the, of slavery and suffering. Time, especially when we take communion, to remember what our life was like before Christ. The fighting, the stabbing, the lying, the cheating, the sleepless nights. We still have the sleepless nights because we spend it with the Lord. We're never alone. The loneliness, the bitterness, the disappointments, But in Christ, he makes everything new. Remember he said, in this world, you will have tribulations. That's a promise. <clears throat> but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. For this reason was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. There's bitterness. There's tears. But you know what? One of the first songs I ever sang, I think I was about 10 years old. 
This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I don't feel at home in this world anymore. Here, you know, some stuff, even, even in our lifetime, we've seen where it was unbearable, the crying, the, the screaming, the, the agony. And as time goes by, as time goes by, you lose that, and you don't cry anymore. You ever wonder what, why God doesn't answer the way we want him to answer sometimes? Why? Can't he see? Can't he see? But you know what I just told you? You know that pain that you suffered all that long time ago? You still see it. But you see it differently because you have a wider perspective. When you're up as high as he is, he sees your pain, but he sees it from a wider perspective. <laughs> he can see the end. And can, he can see what is happening to you. You know what's happening to you through those dark times, through those horseradish times? You know what's happening? You are building a testimony for Christ. When you come out the other end, you have something to say, something to share. I mean, what would you ever say if, if you never failed? If you never fell? If you weren't ever sick? If you got every job you wanted and made all the money in the world? You know, and... and Everything was just going hunky-dory. Everything was great. Where would the testimony be? And then you meet somebody who's broken and bruised and battered and going through horrible stuff, and you tell them, it's too bad, man. My life is great. So well, that's not a testimony. You know, but, but if you tell them, you know what? I've gone through that. And worse. And worse. And you know what God has done for me? That's where he turns the, the horseradish into sweetness. The next, the next, this is my favorite. This is the only thing I remember from the Seder. The chirosis. Anybody know what that is? The chirosis is made to resemble, it, it, it's, it's, it's supposed to remind you of, of, of the mortar used to make bricks back in Egypt. But let me, let, me give, let me give you the recipe. It is a mixture of chopped apples, nuts, raisins, cinnamon, and wine. There are many recipes, you know, for, for that. Uh, there is another one that's made with raisins, figs, and dates. Walnut, cinnamon, sweet wine, um, chopped almonds, um, and so forth. It's, it's really good. I mean, it's good stuff, right? And you know what that is? It is a foretaste. It's a little preview of what is to come. All that fruit, you know that in heaven? There is a river, and along that river are trees. And what is the fruit that those trees give? Different every month. Every month, different fruit. Can you imagine? Wow. Well, what is the fruit? I don't know. It, it, it's out of this world. <laughs> that is good. And I'll be able to eat as much fruit as I want. It's not going to affect, affect my pancreas. I won't have to take insulin. I, it, it won't even make you fat. I mean, it, it. wow. That's what it is. For them, they're remembering the, 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 the bricks that they made, the mud. But for us, it's a foretaste. It is a foretaste of that great, great supper. You know, the children are going to be joining us in in a little bit, and the, um, and the youth are going to be joining us in a little bit. Uh, so let me uh, hurry on to finish. You don't have to say amen if that, that's not the place to say amen. <laughs> and uh, let, me, uh, let me come down. Let me come down, um, down here where I have this. I know he jumps down, but I can't do that. <laughs> Now, unless there's two of you here to catch me. <clears throat> the first cup was the cup. What was it? 
the cup of deliverance. I will deliver you. And th does anyone have um, a bulletin? I, I need one of these little handouts. Oh, we got it. The second cup is the cup of freedom. And I believe it's during the second cup that they recite the ten plagues. I may be wrong, because I left my notes up there. <laughs> that they recite the, the ten plagues. But in order to, um, to, uh, to, to understand the context, their joy is, is counterbalanced by remembering what it cost. For their freedom. Now, in their case, they're thinking, boy, a lot of people died and all these bad things happened. But we know what it really cost for our freedom. If you've been to a Seder, has anyone been to a Seder where they served lamb? You have not. They probably served chicken or something else. If they served lamb, it was not roasted. The Jews believe that. They stopped, actually they stopped uh, uh, serving roast lamb at Passover because of the destruction of the temple. Remember Jesus said there will not be one stone left upon another and in the year 70 AD it happened. The, the, the temple was totally destroyed and the stones carried away and not one stone was left on the other. So they stopped the sacrifices and they stopped uh, roasting the lamb. But I'll tell you why. In, 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 uh, in the Psalms and in, uh, in and Peter, and I forget, one of the other epistles, it talks about Jesus, when he died, descending into hell. You think he suffered on the cross? He had to go to hell. That lamb. And in Revelation, in where it says, uh, uh, I think it's chapter 6, uh, where it talks about, and I saw, it, where it talks about the 24 elders and, and, and all of that, it says, and I saw the, the lamb as though slain. He looked like the slain. That word slain is the same word that could be translated as immolate. Immolate. You know what that? Burnt. And actually, in my Spanish Bible, it does say immolate. And it says it was immolated before the foundation of the world. Now, how do we know he descended to hell? Well, the Psalms say that he who descended also ascended, and he brought captivity captive. Peter tells us that he went to hell and preached to the captives. Now, that can't be Abraham. That can't be Abraham. He wasn't a captive, he was resting. He was enjoying it. Well, he's waiting for, for heaven to open up. He's waiting for Christ to come and take him. But he preached to, he to, to, uh, to those that are in hell, those that were captives. Does it make sense to you that, that from the foundation of the world until Jesus Christ, all those people just go to hell? He went and preached to them. If you were in hell, imprisoned, and in flames, and being tormented, and Jesus came along and said, I have conquered death and hell, you want to come? Uh-huh. There would be a stampede for that door. And he's got the keys. He unlocks it. If you received, um, read Psalm 24, who is this king of glory? He's got entering the gates of glory with all these people that, he's, that, that, um, that he... Set free. Wow. Wow. That's why they don't serve roasted lamb. He was already roasted. Once and for all. You read the book of Hebrews, it just... In the Old Testament, they would go in year after year, lamb after lamb, bull after bull. They would slaughter and drink blood everywhere, every year, all the time, for all these sacrifices. But come Jesus, Jesus once and for all. Once and for all, 
that he sat at the right hand of the Father. So as, as we, we, uh, as we uh, partake of the uh, second cup, I want us to repeat the, uh, the plagues. And what they do is to diminish the joy, to temper the joy after each one, like we'll say the first one is blood. So before you drink, you diminish it a little bit. Oop, all over the cloth. Uh, frogs. Diminish it a little bit. What's the next one? Lice. Lice. Third one, the next one? Wild beast. Wild beast. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm no good at this. Uh, the next one? And then? Oil. Oil. Uh, next one? Hail. Next? Lotus. Next? Darkness. Next? The of the firstborn. Amen. So our joy now is diminished a little bit. But someday, someday we'll have the fullness of joy being in the presence of God in the fullness of God. And so our joy here is tempered. Yeah, it is tempered a little bit, but it is, we do partake of joy, right? The third cup is actually the cup that we are celebrating when we take communion. Because the third cup comes after the breaking of bread. Now, when he broke the bread, that was a big break with tradition. Because the bread was broken by the head of the house or whoever was officiating. He would break the bread without saying a word. It was supposed to be silent. They would pass it and everyone would break off a piece in silence. Jesus breaks the bread and he talks. They must have looked up. And he instituted this whole new thing. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Wow. They must have been like blown away. But I'm sure that he was radiating glory because you don't hear a word from them. They don't, they, no one is saying, but that's not the way it's done. We've never done it that way in our church. Nobody said that. And then came the third cup. That he drank, right? And that's the one that we partake of at communion. And uh, you know what? I'm going to um, to pour these three cups. And if anyone, when we when we start communion, if anyone wants to, um, and I love the fact that kids are here. Kids are, should be part of uh, of uh, of the Passover celebration because the kids would always ask, "What is are supposed to ask? What is different? Why is this night different?" from any other night. And that's when they recite the plagues and the story of liberation and freedom from Egypt. Maybe they watch the Ten Commandments, I don't know. You know, but, but uh, that, that's, that's why children should be at uh, communion. But uh, Jesus took the, the, the third cup. That's when he said, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And that's the one that we drink. Now, there will be little cups like we always have, but if anyone wants to come up here and eat a drink from one of the three cups or dip your bread in it and take it that way, that's fine. There is no set rule in the Bible exactly how it's supposed to be done, unless we're celebrating a Jewish Seder, right? But we're not. This is communion. This is the new covenant. Oh, what about the fourth cup? That dinner was never finished. That's when Jesus said, I, I think it was time for the fourth cup, and maybe somebody gave him the cup, or maybe somebody gave him the, the wine, and Jesus said, we're not going to finish this dinner. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until we're all together in my father's house.
I feel like running around the building or something. I don't know. You know what I felt yesterday as I was buying some of these elements? I felt so bad. I still feel bad. We should have the finest, finest glasses and the finest, finest silver tray or something. I don't know. I just felt buying this tablecloth and these glasses. I just felt, it's not wrong, but I just felt bad. It is such a holy moment. It is such a beautiful thing. Thank God that he looks upon the heart. And this is what, he doesn't want sacrifice. He wants our heart. When we celebrate communion, we remember where he brought us from. We remember that he set us free from every curse that there is. You don't have to react to situations the way you did before. You are a new creation. You are not tied to your parents. You're not tied to your grandparents. The sins of the fathers are not visited upon you anymore. We are set free. And it is only a foretaste of the fourth cup. The fourth cup. Jason and, and the, the group, if you want to come up. And as they, um, as they begin to play, I want us to take a little bit of time and just reflect on your own life, because it says examine yourself. I think that the, that examination is the one that is it. I, I think it's James chapter 5, where he says that if anyone is sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. They will lay hands, anoint him with oil, lay hands on him, and the prayer of faith will heal that person. What else does it say? And if he has sinned, his sins will be forgiven. So there is a sickness there is calamity that comes upon us because we don't examine ourselves at the time of communion. Wow. Wow. I remember as a little boy, I, I, I was telling Carmen about this church in, in Glendale, Arizona when I was a little boy, uh, less than nine years old. I remember uh, communion and, and sitting as a little boy in the back of the church, you know, just sitting there and running around. And there were these two families, and there were these two ladies on opposite sides of the church. And everybody's going forward for communion. It's one of these holy days, holy moments like we have right now. And, and uh, they wouldn't go up, and they wouldn't go up. And somebody gossiped. You know, kids hear everything, right? And, 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 I, and I heard them say, it's that they're mad at each other. Well, they couldn't take communion. And finally, I remember this. I remember that them... They were both crying, you know, they were both being tough. No, neither one was going to give in. I don't know what the problem was. I wouldn't know. But they came towards each other. I remember them meeting halfway in, in, like in the middle aisle there and just hugging each other and crying and crying and crying and crying and then walking together down the aisle to go take communion. I bet there was healing that day. I bet there was curses lifted from their children. Jason?
Yeah, he loves us. Yeah, he loves us. the 
quietly stand and worship the Lord. Father, I pray for healing right now. I pray that as we have drunk symbolically from the cup of deliverance, people would be delivered. People would be redeemed. People would be set free. And Lord, Lord, prepare us, prepare your church to be taken up. 
Come, Lord Jesus. We're ready. We are ready. We want to go. This morning, Lord, at this holy moment, we remember our pastors and ask your blessing upon them, Lord, that they celebrate communion together and together with us in spirit and unity with you. We worship you, Holy Father. Take a moment to receive, receive of the Holy Spirit healing, wisdom, guidance. Lord, as we examine ourselves, I pray that you would bring healing, healing in our finances, healing in our relationships, healing in our minds from our past healing in our very psyche for our way of thinking. We hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. Journey of Faith is a four-square Christian church located in Glendora, California. For more information on Journey of Faith, visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626 626- 914-3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you. Thank you for joining the journey.